So we were able to get some grapes from our local farm stand. They're in season now. And it used to be that I did all of my grape juice. I did it the old fashioned way. I pressed them all and cooked them all and did all of the extra work. And last year I decided to get a steam juicer. It was some of the best money I have ever spent. It took a job that was like six hours long for six quarts and shrunk it all down to like 30 minutes and even then it's just like me putting in the grapes in the steam juicer and then it puts all the grape juice in there for me and I don't have to do a ton of work. I can multitask and do other things while it's doing its steaming thing. At a time of year when we are so busy with preserving so many other foods, it's just really nice to have a couple of good tools in the kitchen to shrink down all of the extra labor. I am grateful that this is sort of a modern homesteading situation where I can do that. Although I do know how to do a lot of things the old fashioned way too, in case it ever came to that. For the steam juicer, I am gonna show you how that works. Here's the steam juicer. The first part is the lid that just traps in the steam. The second part is where you put your fruit in. So it's, thank you Dax, he's demonstrating the fruit. It's got the perforations here. So as it steams, all the juice will drop into this basket below. So you can do any type of fruit in this. They have a manual and a guide where you can see all different kinds of fruits and also how much you need to put in. And then this middle part, so all the grape juice will steam into here. And then it has this little thing that goes out and then it goes straight into the jars. You have to open this little clip up and then it releases the juice out. And it also has a hook so you can kind of hook it on the side here as it's going so it doesn't spill all over the place. So that's the middle part. So right in here it has that little middle part and that's where it'll drain out. And then in the very bottom, this is just where the water goes for the steaming. So thank you. <laughs> and that's it. And you just steam away. After we filled the steam juicer with the water and the grapes, we turn the heat on. And what we're doing here is we're moving a table over underneath where the juicer is. That's because when you make the juice come out you want to have your jars on a level surface below that juicer because it just flows with gravity and so it makes it easier once the jars are filled or even a little beforehand you can do a taste test to see if the jars need sugar at all based on how sweet your grapes are and your personal preferences. So after my jars are filled, I wipe the rims, put on the lids and then the rings and put them into my canner and process them for 15 minutes. And then I let the jars cool for five minutes and I take them out. So the next day we use some of the leftover pulp that was remaining in the juicer to make grape jam. My favorite pectin to use is Pomona's pectin, and the reason for that is because I can use a lower sugar. But before you get started, you have to mix a half a cup of water with a half a teaspoon of calcium, which is provided in the package. Then I add my sugar, and the amount I add is based on how much grape pulp that I made. So I think I had about four cups of grape pulp, and so I measured out a cup and a half of honey but I didn't actually pour that all in because I remembered that I needed to keep some back to mix in the actual pectin into. And you mix in two, I mixed in two teaspoons of the pectin based on how much grape pulp I had in there. And then separately you add the two teaspoons of that pre-mixed calcium water into the pot. And I forgot to video this part, but I did also add a quarter cup of lemon juice into the mix. And then you bring everything to a full rolling boil. And then the final step is to add the sugar and the pectin mixture and you mix it really good and it boils for a couple of minutes and try not to burn your hands while it splatters everywhere. <laughs> I That always happens to me. So if you have any tips on how to prevent that, please let me know. I am using half pint jars to can this jam. And the reason for that is because this is a low sugar jam. So once you open it, 
the shelf life is a lot shorter and it doesn't last as long in the refrigerator. So the smaller size works a lot better for us because we can eat it all before it goes bad. So the processing time on this grape jam is 10 minutes, but I add an extra minute of boiling time because we are located just above a thousand feet sea level. So I do need to add that extra minute and then I let them cool for five minutes in the canner after the heat has been off. Here is the finished results of the jam and the juice. We're harvesting our cow peas and the kids really like harvesting them because they know what comes from them. They really like that cowpea soup that we make. What? You just mm -hmm. want to be my mommy? I'll come over and pick with you. No. Really? Second. Honey, get them closer. Today we are making one of our favorite canned foods. It's called Cajun cow pea soup and actually in this book it's called Cajun black eyed peas. But I do not grow that specific variety of cow pea. Black eyed pea is just a different variety of cow pea. We grow the Arkansas Razorback cow peas and it's so delicious. I just put some olive oil in this pot. This other pot here has my chicken broth in it, or chicken stock actually. And then I'm gonna add all of the veggies that I chopped into this pan right now. Cool. Uh, yeah. Oh, wait, so, yeah. Yeah. The recipe calls for celery. I don't have any in my garden, but I did freeze some earlier this year, so I'm just gonna use this. It's already chopped, which is super nice, and then put it in the pot. When I make this sausage, usually I will chop it into like half inch pieces first and then put it in the pot to cook. I didn't do that today because this casing on the sausage is so thin what came from the butcher. It basically was falling right out of the casing when I was cutting it, so I decided to cook it whole to see if I could kind of get it to stay together a little bit better. And for the most part, it did. So I'm just gonna chop it right now and then add it to the pot. So this recipe has the option of adding all sausage or you can add some sausage and some bacon. And in the past, all I've ever done is just sausage. And this year, since we had our own pigs, we had a lot of bacon. So we did the sausage and the bacon. And then at this point, we're adding all of the stock, the water, the vinegar, and the bay leaves. And then you bring that to a boil. And you add in your bell peppers, jalapenos, and then finally, the black eyed peas, which in our case, is another variety of cow pea, Arkansas Razorback cow peas. And the last thing I add is the kale. I wait to do this at the very, very end and really just let it wilt in the pan, which is a little bit different than what the recipe states because it is going to cook plenty as this whole thing pressure cans. And I don't think I've mentioned it yet, but all of the information to make this recipe is from a book. I will link the book down in the video description. I made a lot of soup and this year I invested in another pressure canner. So I have two that I can use and we do actually have two stovetops. However, I cannot run both my pressure canners at the same time on those two stovetops because 
one of our cooktops is in induction and the other one is electric and the induction does not work with the aluminum pressure canner so i can only put my pressure canner on our electric oven the other one i could possibly put outside on a outdoor propane stove at the same time, but I do need to be around to make sure that the pressure is right. So for right now, I just do one at a time and then about halfway through the processing time of that first one, I will start to prep the next one for the jars. And so immediately after that first pressure canning batch is over, then I put the next batch on the stovetop and it actually saves me about an hour to an hour and a half because you have to let that pressure naturally release before you can open up the top of the canner. So I finished 14 jars the first day and then I put the soup in the fridge overnight and I finished the rest the next day. So we got an additional six quarts, so 20 quarts total of this Cajun cowpea soup. So the next day we picked all of our black beans because they were ready and mature and we were heading into a frost soon so we needed to get all of them picked and I decided I wanted to make some pork and black beans. So the kids shelled the black beans while I prepped the rest of the recipe. This is another canning recipe and I have never tried it before, so I hope it's good. And again, I'll put the link where you can find the book for this recipe down in the video description. One of the things that I'm trying to do a lot more this year is to make more ready-made meals for when we are busy because we are busy a lot. And when you make a big batch all at once, it does save you time. And it helps me to take advantage of the vegetables that I have in season. So I use a variety of preservation methods to make these ready-made meals. In a previous video, I freeze dried a whole bunch of chili and that worked really well for the freeze dryer because our meat was very lean. Fats are often the first thing to go rancid in preserved food, so that's why I try and stay away from excessive fats when I'm using the freeze dryer. So one of the things that you need to look out for when you're canning with a higher fat meat is when it cooks, it will leave this fat layer on the top. And a lot of times as it's cooking, that fat can bubble up and go underneath your jar lid and the fat can prevent your lid from sealing properly. So if your lid doesn't seal, at that point you would need to reprocess the whole jar or just put it in the refrigerator or eat it right away. In most of these pressure canning recipes, there's generally a higher amount of headspace at the top of the jars and that really helps prevent that problem. As I was filling the jars, I realized that the amount of jars this recipe said it would, it would make was slightly off. I did a double batch of these pork and beans and it should have made 10 quarts, but it only barely, barely made nine quarts. After the jars were all ready, I processed them for an hour and a half. And then that same day, I also processed some chicken broth so here's the finished results of all the chicken broth we did, the pork and beans, and the Cajun cowpea soup. Then about a week later, we started on our apple preserving, and we decided to make applesauce because I was completely out of all of the applesauce that I had in my pantry. Our apple trees aren't producing very much still because they're young, so I got these apples from a local orchard. I got Jonagold, which is the more green-yellow type, and then Jonathan, which has a little bit more red to the skin, and those make a really good applesauce for me. So the way I make the apples is we put them through the apple peeler core slicer, and I don't take off the skins at that point. I have the kids leave them on just because we have that applesauce maker, so it can take off those skins, but we can still get in, hopefully, some of those nutrients that are in the apple skins during the first cook. And then 
for one of the apple sauces, the kids asked me to add a little bit of sugar and cinnamon. So I did that. And then the other one we left plain because that one is going to be more for just doing some baking with that applesauce. As far as a recipe goes, I do use the Ball Complete Book of Home Preserving as a guide. You do need to add some lemon juice to this. So in order to make sure I have the right amount, I look at the recipe for that. The added sugar is optional. Like I said, we added sugar to one batch, but not to another. And on the batch that I did add sugar, I only added a quarter of what they recommended in the recipe, and that was plenty. Thank you.